Good morning and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us here this morning. Maybe this is your first time tuning in and joining us. We wanna extend a welcome to you and trust that you are blessed and benefit from what you hear today. Uh, we want to start with prayer. There's just so much and so many people that are in need of prayer. Uh, we want to pray for the direction of our nation. We want to pray for our local community that God will continue to open up, open up doors of utterance. We also want to remember Cornerstone Pentecostal Church and members in particular. And lastly, we want to remember our brothers and sisters around the world. Maybe you have a special unspoken request or several requests. It's a perfect time to make those known unto God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. God, we know that we are in your hands and we know that you are present in this world. Father, we pray for the direction of this nation. We pray that the influence of the Spirit, the Word, and your church can have an impact, a determining impact on this nation. Father, we also pray for our local region and community. We pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church and pray that you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out your healing virtue upon your people. And lastly, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. We ask that you furnish them with a hedge of protection and keep them in this hour. We ask all this in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said, amen. Well, we are going to go to the book of Revelation this morning. And I'm just going to read one verse of scripture. It's found in a few, uh, the book of Revelation chapter two. And verse number one says, under the angel of the church of Ephesus. That's all I want to say. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. The seven letters to the seven churches have long been a fascination of Bible students, biblical commentators, scholars, students of the word of God. And right here at, at the beginning of this incredible book, we have letters that are being given directly, directly from Jesus Christ. To John the Revelator, he's on Patmos, he's exiled uh, on a place, banished, if you please, in an environment for criminals. And it is here on this rocky isle that he is in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he receives this revelation. Part of this revelation is that is found in chapter number one, where he sees Jesus in the midst of these seven candlesticks. We find out that these candlesticks are none other than the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he also has seven stars in his right hand. And these seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, I read Ephesians chapter, or pardon me, Revelation chapter two, verse number one. It is they, it is the letter to the church at Ephesus. Every one of these letters is addressed to the angel of the church. Now, regardless of where you are on the learning curve of theological study, education, um, textual criticism, uh, theologian, whatever you are, everybody over the last 2000 years has all interpreted that word angel to mean the pastor. The direct translation of that word means messenger. In a practical sense, 
every single, for the last 2,000 years, there are no variations. Um, I've heard that there's some commentators that believe that each one of these letters had like uh, a type of guardian angel that were attached to them. Make no mistake about it. These letters are written specifically to the pastors of these local congregations, okay? The reason why that is important to us is because it is the role of the pastor, it is the responsibility of the pastor, especially in these seven letters. We, we're, we'll talk about some other things and some other applications, but right now in these seven letters to these seven churches, um, there are the perspective that is being given here is not the perspective of the world. It is not a denominational perspective. It is from the perspective of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And so that nothing else matters. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people in the church think. It doesn't matter what um, family members think that are outside the church. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. <clears throat> the only thing that really matters is, is pleasing the Lord Jesus. It is his church. And the letters to these, to these messengers, these pastors, is placed as a direct responsibility to their headship and their ministry to make whatever modifications, whatever changes. Um, if you've got the doctrine of Balaam in your church, get it out. If you've got the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in your church, get it out. If you have uh, Jezebel in your church, a so-called prophetess that is teaching God's people uh, to fornicate, get her out. We, we could spend all morning talking about the nuances and the individual um, letters themselves, which we are going to be talking about tomorrow night. When you, By the time you're reading this, it will be tonight. We're going to start our study on the seven ch churches of Asia Minor. But make no mistake about it. It is the sole responsibility of the pastor to make whatever changes need to be made to please the Lord Jesus. You know, we're living in a day and an age to where you can have people that have the same perspective of salvation. Um, in our case, there is no other, there is no other pathway for salvation outside of Acts 2:38, which is repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. There, there is no other message. It is, it is the the fulfillment of the. The message that we see in John chapter three of uh, the new birth of of including water and spirit, and we we'd be here all morning talking about that. You already know about that. However, because Pentecost is such a large has become has become a cluttered landscape. I'm just going to put it that way. It's it's now a cluttered landscape in which you have people that believe certain nuances and things about this over here, people that, that allow this over here, people that permit, notice, notice the terminology that I'm using. Uh, leadership over here will per permit this, they will allow this, they have a different view of this, they have a different view of that, so on and so forth. There is a certain amount of confusion that I believe that is unhealthy in this hour. And recognize here, in the book of Revelation, we are at the end of this. You have the introduction of the ministry of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have people preach, being be preached into the church as the kingdom of God is being proclaimed in the earth. The gospel is being preached. People come into the church. We have come through the epistles, which are letters of instruction. We have come through the general epistles, epistles which are letters of instruction to the church in its entirety. And now we're at the book of Revelation. But notice, as we, as we address the epistles, which are letters of instruction, we move into those areas of like Second Peter and the book of Jude, where it actually begins to talk about 
people in the church, most notably some leaders, corrupt leaders. Um, you get into First and Second Timothy where you have Hymenaeus and Philetus. Um, you have people that are in a false doctrine. You have people that are put out of the church. You have people that, that spring a leak and they attack leadership. And you have all these kind of things. It first starts being introduced to Jesus. Now people are being invited into the church. The church begins. The church flourishes. Now we're getting into those areas where it's being qualified. Certain behaviors are being qualified. Things, things are being revealed inside the church. But now we're at the end in the book of Revelation. And now we're seeing that the last message that Jesus has for individual specific churches through John the Revelator is directly to the pastor about what Jesus sees going on in that church. Where is the pastor? How is it that the pastor doesn't see this himself? How is it that the pastor um, has allowed the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? How is it that uh, Thyatira has this going on? How is it that, that Sardis has this going on? How is it that uh, Ephesus is allowed to lose their first love? On and on and on. Good questions. But Jesus is letting the pastor know, he's letting spiritual leadership know that there are things in that congregation that need to be adjusted. I want to tell you that in the hour in which we're living, you need to leave the pastor alone. The best thing that you can do, and I'm not just saying this for me because I am a pastor. I'm pastoring a wonderful, godly uh, congregation here. But it's not really me that, that we need to please. It's Jesus that we need to please. And so as Jesus communicates to the headship, there's a lot of people sitting in our congregations today that are saying, I don't see a problem with this. And what's wrong with this? And what's wrong with that? And what's wrong with this? The hour in which we live, things have, things have been uh, so deeply imbued with a enculturation of living in America that people have felt that they just have a right to voice their opinion. And why can't I do this? And this is permitted over here. And that's permitted over there. And how come it can't be like this here? It's not the responsibility of the pew to influence the pulpit. When that starts happening, that is, you are looking at the beginning, if it's, if it's left to influence, of sedition and maybe even rebellion. There are biblical examples of this where you have people, the followers, try to correct the leaders. It's never going to happen that way, not in God's economy. God will communicate to his leadership the adjustments that need to make. And I'm bringing it all down to this. Because you see the severity of this. You see where Jesus is, is talking about that there's a need for repentance. We need to pray for those that are in leadership. Pray for those that are in authority. Pray that our pastor is staying on track. Pray that our pastor is is that God is speaking to our pastor and, and the church stays clean and the church stays on track and the church keeps all of these voices at bay and the church keeps the influence of the world out. And da, 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 da. Pray for your pastor. Leadership is under incredible attack in this hour. Not just, not just even leadership in the church, but leadership as a whole is under incredible attack in this world and in this hour. So, there you have it. The seven churches of Asia Minor. Pray for the pastor. Because God is going to communicate with him. And when the pastor gets up and needs to make certain adjustments and he needs to follow the Holy Ghost, and he's responding to that, he's following the Holy Ghost, he's responding to the Word of God, it's time to get behind the pastor get behind the pastor. And I know that you do, but this is what we have to give you today. God bless you. Thank you for joining us here today. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow.